Okay, so good morning. I am Paolo Cappelletti, lead engineer at, at Horizon Labs, and um, this talk will be about token min chain. As you know, is the first sidechain we deployed to mainnet, and so uh, I will uh, present a little bit the design, and then uh, um, I have summarized some activities uh, we had to take care of in order to go to mainnet and then a look at what's next. Um, but first, uh, let's start on how we started. Um, so, something like one year ago, we noticed a lot of uh, interest uh, increasing in tokenization stuff and uh, uh, a lot of potential partners and customers asking for uh, token use cases and also a lot of uh, news uh, also in the um, uh, newspaper and uh, mm, about uh, uh, the increasing uh, share of the NFT market. And at the same time, we had already some proof of concept uh, uh, related uh, mm, something to similar to NFT and tokens. Uh, one of them was our game chain proof of concept. So, um, it was a sidechain uh, um, designed to handle uh, uh, um, a backend for a gaming platform. And uh, um, it was already designed to handle a catalog of items. And if you think a, a bit, there is not so much difference between a, a catalog of items and a, a collection of, of NFTs. And so um, we took all of this, and when we had to uh, think uh, uh, the first use case, the uh, first sidechain to develop to main it, we started to work on what later has been named uh, Token Mint. What is Token Mint? It's like um, a, a platform, um, a collection of tools uh, that enables handling uh, um, tokens in our uh, ecosystem. And uh, the Token Mint chain is uh, like at the base of this uh, platform. Uh, below we have the SDK because uh, as any other sidechain, our chain is developed in uh, using the SDK. And then uh, on the upper layer, we have the uh, front-end stuff. So the Cobalt Wallet, our token generator, the Block Explorer, a JavaScript library we developed to um, uh, enable the communication between these tools and the token chain itself, and then some monitoring tools. What were the main requirements? Uh, obviously, the ability to handle multiple types of tokens and uh, the ability to declare uh, the token on the fly, let's say, so uh, nothing um, uh, hard-coded from the beginning of the sidechain, and uh, the ability to support both fungible and non-fungible tokens. So um, here, the, the, the distinction is very simple. Uh, fungible tokens are the ones that are non-unique and uh, interchangeable. The, the most simple uh, example is the uh, a currency. So if you have uh, one Bitcoin and you exchange it with another Bitcoin, at the end is the same. Uh, Non-fungible tokens are unique and they, have, uh, uh, they can't be uh, replaced it's, uh, each other, let's say. And uh, each one has its own ad identity. They became famous with uh, NFT images, but at, at the end you, have, you can have uh, an NFT also for any kind of uh, object, uh, also physical object like, like uh, a car or a property. Another main requirement was to um, handle uh, precision, uh, configurable precision at declaration and, and at least support the uh, Ethereum one that is uh, uh, 18 decimals digit, this obviously for the fungible tokens, and the possibility to limit the total supply. So let's have a look at the design. Um, usually when, when you design sidechain, these are the four main points of extension, let's say boxes, transaction, API endpoints, and validation rules. But before I, I would like to highlight this uh, um, issue we had from the beginning. So to uh, go from the Ethereum account based to our uh, SDK that uh, un until now is UTXO based. 
uh, until now because in the future we will introduce the EVM compatibility, but uh, for now our SDK uh, is based on UTXO model. Um, the difference is that in the UTXO model you have a transaction that uh, burns UTXO and produce UTXO uh, in output. What is a UTXO? It's just an unspend output from a previous transaction. In the account-based model, you have balances. So um, is uh, kind is, is difference. And um, uh, obviously, when we started to work on token, we looked at, at this, uh, the most uh, spread um, platform that was the one, the, the most spread standard that was the one in the Ethereum world. Here you see some. Uh, standard interface, for example, the DRC, ERC20 is the one handle that handles fungible tokens. And um, so we took that, that uh, as, a, let's say, a, a standard to, to be inspired, but we had to change a little bit. And not all the things could be modeled because we were UTXO-based. This is another um, representation of uh, account of um, and UTXO model. This is taken from our uh, uh, website, uh, our academy, that explain it uh, quite well. So in the left, uh, you have the account based. You can think at each row as a, uh, a state. Uh, as you know, a blockchain is a, like a state machine. So you go from one state to, the, to another state, applying some, tr some transaction. And in the account model, uh, go to the next state, you, you just have to, to update all the balances and all the storages of the smart contracts. In the UTXO model, uh, you burn UTXO and create UTXO, and uh, um, the state is represented by the list of all the unspent UTXO. So at the end, we, um, these are the, the boxes uh, we defined for our token chain. A box is like an abstraction of uh, a UTXO, uh, in our SDK, so uh, uh, it's like a new tick, so of Bitcoin, but uh, you can also define additional properties inside the box. And so we define three types of boxes. The token one, which is like the blueprint, uh, descriptor of each token type, and it must be declared before any other operation. It, it implicitly defines the authority that will be able to mint token later because the owner of this descriptor, let's say, is like the owner of the token. And uh, uh, it will be needed in the following transaction to, my, um, to mint. And then we have token fungible and non-fungible um, that represent the um, single uh, uh, data re um, related to each token. Um, there is this unique identifier um, in the token itself that it is auto-generated and uh, is, is like uh, something similar like a smart contract ID in uh, Ethereum. So it, 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 uh, um, it has the utility to uniquely identify the token uh, and uh, um, each one of the token fungible and token non-fungible box reference a specific token by uh, carrying as well the unique identifier is like a foreign key in a, a SQL database. And then for token fungible, we have just uh, a token value property. For token non-fungible, the most important property is a serial number, which is another uh, unique identifier, but this time is not uh, um, auto-generated by the sidechain, but can be chosen by the, the, minti the minting authority. And uh, um, the unique constraint is that it must be unique. So after defining boxes, we defined all the transactions uh, to handle them. So a first group of transactions for manage the token. So the declare, the update transaction. The second one is to update some properties used for NFT, so like the base URI. And then operation on fungible and, and non-fungible tokens, mean, transfer, barn uh, of this type of tokens. And uh, um, after that, you have to define custom endpoints. These are uh, needed because uh, our, um, uh, our node 
uh, our site chain node, the, uh, the main um, entry point, let's say, to uh, communicate with it is via REST API. You have some, a set of default API, but then you can extend them uh, with the custom one for your application. And usually there are a couple of groups of uh, endpoints. The first one are the endpoints to create the transaction, the custom transaction inside the, the node wallet. And uh, then you can uh, define additional properties also to uh, provide, addit provide additional views on the state data. Uh, so for example, in our case, we added uh, uh, an endpoint to have a, the token balance giving a, a specific um, uh, token unique identifier and address. And yeah, this is the most important part you have to code when uh, uh, you define a site and so the consensus rules, they, uh, um, they are used by the nodes to validate blocks and uh, to reject a transaction not well formed. So uh, there are three types of checks uh, you have to handle. The semantic checks are just checks you can uh, uh, execute uh, on the data of the transaction itself. The validation rules uh, instead can, be, uh, can use, let's say, some state outside of the transaction. Um, so it's a, state a state created by the previous transaction. And we can have validation rules against the single transaction uh, or, or, or we can also compare the single transaction against other transaction of the block or against other transaction of, of the mempool. For example, an example of a semantic rule can be, uh, okay, the, ser the symbol of the token is not, uh, has to have maximum six characters, for example. An example of validation rules can be um, my, uh, token non-fungible serial number must be unique. So for this uh, rule, you have to maintain the list of the previous uh, minted token to check that you, have, you haven't used the serial number in before. And uh, um, you have also to check that if you have two transactions in the same block creating a, a token, uh, they cannot create the same token, so that's why you have this, um, and the same on the mempool. That's why you have, you have this uh, uh, duplication, let's say, in the validation rules. And then, obviously, you can also add checks on endpoints, like any other uh, REST API. You can say, okay, for example, the symbol data has not to be empty, so are just a uh, check to block, let's say, uh, a transaction even before uh, posted to, the, to a node. And yeah, to mm, hand this part, I have put some developer tips coming from our experience. So mm, the first one is always to start from modeling the data structures. At least uh, for me, this is the most uh, easiest way. And then look, mm, think about the transaction. And other tips can be design carefully the consensus rules and always think that transaction can be posted outside your application code. So, uh, for example, you can have a transaction that, that produces, uh, that must produce only one box in output. Uh, okay, you, you code everything and uh, uh, inside your endpoint, you, say you have uh, put uh, this logic and you may think that it's enough, but it's not enough because uh, Anyone else maybe can produce the byte array of the transaction outside your application and try to post it uh, from the row transaction post and point. And so you have to add this check also in the consensus rule as well. And uh, mm, yeah, another tip is to keep the state as simple as possible. Uh, so everything that can be der derived from the state uh, and can be computed externally uh, it's better to be uh, uh, demanded to, um, delegated to, an, uh, for example, an explorer. This is to try to, to have the code of the node as light as possible, also the storages of the node as light as possible. 
and uh, provide enough space for future extensions. So um, since blockchains are uh, not so easy to, um, to update, uh, because sometimes you need an hard fork to make uh, changes, is, uh, the, be the, the, best, the more you think in advance on what uh, hard fields you, you, you may introduce in the future, the better it is, because you will not need uh, an hard fork. And then, obviously, write automatic tests, especially for the consensus rules, since, uh, yeah, this is a, a state machine, so tests are often not so difficult to, implement, to be implemented, but they are very useful because uh, in the future, if you will extend your site chain, uh, you can check that you have not broken anything. Okay, the second part, I have uh, put some, um, a summary of some actions we did for, uh, in order to go to mainnet. Uh, so, and I have divided them in three categories, security, reliability, and integration with other components. Let's go first on the security. So the, the first one is quite obvious, the deploy bug free code. And yeah, we had a flow for internal code review with uh, uh, at least two uh, at minimum two review per, um, per pull request by two um, separate developers. And then uh, we also had an external auditing from uh, an external company that looked at, at the code at the end to look for uh, vulnerabilities. Another goal was to prevent transaction flooding. So um, maybe a malicious user that uh, tried to post a lot of transaction just to block the, the, the nodes. And, and, and so we uh, put some um, uh, attention on the infrastructure to block uh, heavy traffic, but also we um, uh, implemented a malformed transaction detection already on the Explorer. So looking at the bytecode of the transaction posted in, in the Explorer, we try to uh, check if it is a, a valid transaction. And if not, we block it uh, even there before even uh, posting it to the nodes. And then uh, another goal <coughs> was to prevent the 51% attack in the early stage of deployment. And for this, we deployed a new um, feature inside the SDK itself, the Close Forger support. Let's look at it. Uh, so this is a use case of SDK extension for, for application needs. So there was not this feature in the SDK and we helped the engineering team to hard hit and now is, is there for any sidechain. And so the goal here is to restrict the forgers uh, uh, only to a predefined list and, uh, but with the possibility to relax uh, this uh, restriction in, in, a, in the future. Uh, why we needed it? Because at, at the beginning, uh, we had maybe less, uh, a few nodes, and uh, we didn't want to put a lot of forge stake, but as you know, our sidechain are proof of stake, so we didn't want that uh, anyone external, let's say, would bring up uh, uh, nodes with uh, more forge stake uh, just to make some hard attacks. So we implemented this feature, and. Uh, how is it, it is implemented? There is a, a list of hallowed forgers that can be optionally specified in the configuration file. Uh, each forger is identified by two keys, and um, if present, the consensus check that uh, the for, uh, each new block posted is, uh, has been forged by uh, a forger on the list. But we also implemented a new core transaction, open stake transaction, to relax this constraint in the future. Uh, and so each forger on the list can execute this transaction mm, just one time, meaning it, it is voting to open the forging. And so uh, when the majority of the forgers have voted, uh, the constraint is disabled. And so without any need to update the sidechain, you can relax the constraint and uh, everything st start to, to work in a, more, uh, in a more decentralized way, let's say. And uh, yeah, the second section are, is about re reliability. So uh, we wanted to keep track of status of the sidechain. And for this, we uh, developed 
uh, a lot of monitoring scripts um, and tools to check, for example, that a sidechain is uh, um, has, has generated uh, a certificate back to the main chain, uh, to check that each sidechain node is uh, at the same tip uh, and they are following the, uh, the main chain correctly and so on. And um, we also wanted to survive to sidechain seizing. So when uh, it happens, uh, it happens when uh, a sidechain is not able to send back to the main chain a certificate uh, within an epoch. Um, and so we have this rule that uh, after a certain amount of time, the sidechain is declared died, let's say, from the main chain, at least uh, uh, since now, because in the future we, we will probably uh, deploy a feature on the main chain to have uh, um, optional seizing on sidechain. But for now, there is this possibility. And so we wanted, anyway, to be able to uh, back up the status and restore the status on a, on a new sidechain without losing all the, the status. And uh, um, I will talk about this um, in a while. And then we had also uh, some functionality to avoid data corruption of the storages of the node. Let's, let's look at the backup and restore. So in case of sidechain seizing, uh, as I told I, we want to be able to take a snapshot of the sidechain uh, and restore it in a new sidechain. We implemented a backup tool inside the SDK that can be optionally uh, invoked by the application via command line. And it basically creates a, uh, in a folder like a backup of uh, all the UTXO, so of all the unspent boxes of your sidechain. Uh, there is an endpoint that it is used by this command to um, return the uh, most uh, safest backup point. This is why, uh, because we cannot take the uh, latest tip of, of the nodes. Uh, because we have to prevent some corner cases of double spend for, from, for um, uh, if we have some forward transfer from the main chain, for example. So we, we, we have to back up a little uh, before, and this endpoint will tell you which is the height uh, safest to, to take the snapshot. And then we extend the, the node bootstrap procedure to um, uh, be able to uh, load this uh, restore um, this backup in a new sidechain at the beginning of the node. So when, when the node is still empty, if uh, there is this backup in a predefined folder, it is loaded and uh, you have the UTXO coming from the previous backup. This is obviously a, an emergency uh, operation, but uh, can be useful in emergency uh, time and uh, mm, the other feature I talked before is the safe stop and storage reconciliation. So um, each state or each node state is uh, saved on some storages uh, on file system. And but uh, uh, yeah, there was a case that if you kill, for example, a node um, brute force, uh, it can happen that some storages are not. Uh, saved correctly, and so they are not at the same uh, height, let's say. O all the storages are versioned uh, by block 8 because uh, uh, we, we must be able to make block revert, uh, but they, they must be aligned at the same height. And so uh, we added this shutdown hook to allow application side to go close gracefully any custom storage, but we also extended the SDK with a procedure that uh, uh, at startup, uh, it, it checks that all the, all the storages are at the same height. If not, uh, they are uh, the ones that are uh, above are uh, reverted to a common version. And so at this time, the node will be able to start anyway. And then we will start, it will start to sync up with the other nodes uh, uh, and uh, reach latest height. Last uh, feature set are the integration with other components. So we added the JavaScript library, as I told you at the beginning, to uh, integrate with uh, uh, tools, other tools. 
we added um, a support on the Explorer to detect uh, some boxes that were not inside uh, blocks. Uh, and we also uh, supported the infrastructure to design a Docker-based uh, deployment. So we organized the code base, let's say, in a way that was uh, easy to be later deployed via using Docker. And about the integration on, on the Explorer, yeah, here, here the problem was that um, uh, the Explorer is uh, uh, notified only of uh, uh, new blocks. Uh, and uh, there is a WebSocket event. Uh, and uh, after that, the Explorer indexes this uh, block and uh, create its own index to present its data. But there were a couple of corner cases where you don't have uh, uh, new boxes inside the block uh, itself. And where one is uh, the theory redistribution UTXOs, so, so the, uh, the UTXO coming uh, by redistributing the fee to the forgers in the next blocks uh, uh, that are calculated, let's say, by each node, but not published in, inside the block. And another corner case was the restore boxes coming from that initial backup I told before. And so uh, we expanded the communication protocol to uh, cover these cases. To, um, for the first case, we extended the WebSocket uh, data. And for the, the, the second one, we had an endpoint that it is uh, queried by the Explorer at Bootstrap to sync up the restore as well. OK, looks, a look of what's next. So um, yeah, I, I didn't put a timeline here because uh, uh, it's still subject the roadmap to changes according to, to strategy. But at least we have identified some paths, let's say. The first one is to complete the NFT support. Uh, because yeah, some feature also that uh, I showed you regarding the non-fungible uh, tokens in reality are not yet to main it, but we, were, we have already started to test them on testnet, so we'll soon go to main it. Another track will be uh, regarding interoperability, so um, the ability to integrate with our AVM SDK and the ability to cross uh, chain exchange the token. So there is a talk after this one uh, talking about the sidechain to sidechain protocol uh, and uh, that it is uh, being designed. And after that, uh, it will be available. Uh, we will be able to uh, exchange token, declare on token mint on another sidechain, for example. Another track is uh, related to the open sourcing and decentralization. So um, uh, here, once we have completed the auditing, we want to open source the code and uh, allow also any other uh, third party to run notes and so become forgers and earn maybe fees uh, by forging. And then regarding the future extension, here I have put uh, uh, one interesting uh, extension, uh, which is our ZK token. I mean, so adding zero knowledge to token chain. So as you know, we have uh, a very strong uh, uh, cryptograph, uh, cryptography team. And uh, we have a, a lot of knowledge about the zero knowledge stuff. And we have already started to design some circuits to uh, implement some uh, uh, feature using zero knowledge also on, on sidechain on token mint. Uh, for example, you can, an example use can be, um, I want to enforce uh, that the, the initial minting will go to a set of addresses, but I don't want to, uh, to um, declare these addresses. So I want to keep them private uh, uh, or uh, some other feature like this still in, uh, mm, in design mode. And uh, uh, another future extension could be the monitoring tools. So um, 
collect all this script already available and design uh, a really um, portable, let's say, moni monitoring uh, tool that can be used also by any other site and with some visual, for example, uh, UI. Conclusion, so a lot of first times in uh, our ecosystem, we <coughs> delivered the first site chain to mainnet and uh, yeah, we have, uh, we had also the first uh, auditing, uh, first DevOps site chain ready for mainnet. Uh, it, we tested also the backup and store procedure in uh, testnet and uh, we also delivered, uh, we, uh, this was also the first side chain tested and by the community because with the Cobalt wallet we uh, allowed the community to test uh, the functionalities because before going to mainnet and was also the first side chain uh, um, uh, integrated with other front ends tools. We solved a lot, of, a lot of challenges and we added value also to SDK because uh, as I told you, there are some features that now are present and uh, were not there uh, before and will be available also for the uh, future uh, uh, sidechain. Uh, we tested a lot uh, cross-team collaboration because uh, we need a lot of um, uh, uh, synchronization between the teams both for developing and testing and deploying. So I want to help, uh, I want to thank the, all the team members and also all, all the other teams uh, involved in this uh, release. This is the, our main entry point of Token Mint. You can go there to, to check, uh, uh, to download our Cobalt and test and uh, get also other information. That's all. Thank you.